Indonito with us tonight. Uh, uh, Dr. Don John Indonito is an assistant professor of anthropology at Eastern Kentucky University, and his primary research interests are social and ecological conditions related to mortuary monument construction by the cultural archaeologist called Mount Taylor, who inhabited the St. John's River Valley and Atlantic coast of northeast Florida. In addition to late archaic mortuary monuments, Dr. Indonino also has a long-standing research stone tool analysis and determining the sources of stone in Florida. When not teaching or conducting research, John uh, enjoys restoring his turn-of-the-century Victorian home and collecting records, performing uh, uh, with, uh, with that, and, uh, and also cooking. All right. Yes. Very nice. So uh, please join me in welcoming jo Dr. John Indonino. Okay, so uh, the way I came to begin researching at Tomoka was actually through my doctoral dissertation. I worked at a site of a similar age, of a similar type, in the St. John's River Valley near Sanford. And there's some very close connections between that site and Tomoka. So when I finished my dissertation and I was completely sick of Thornhill Lake, I turned my gaze to the coast uh, and started investigating that in early 2013. Uh, but I got a little bit ahead of myself here. Uh, I think most of you know where the Tomoka State Park is. If you don't, it's in northeast Florida, very, very far near the northern end of Volusia County. Um, there is, is a state park there, but you can't actually visit the mounds when you do the normal visitation at the park. It's, uh, it's hidden. It's out of view. Uh, the public can't access it, at least not yet. Um, so, the Tomoka Complex has... Um, confirmed 10 different mounds. Most of those are from the Thornhill Lake phase of Mount Taylor, which is well illustrated by these kinds of artifacts. These are called banner stones, and those actually came from Mound 6 at Tomoka. They're currently in the American Museum of Natural History in New York, and they were excavated in 1882 by A.E. Douglas, who worked for the Coastal Survey. They were mapping Florida, they found a mound, they said, let's have some fun and dig up a mound. And when they did, they found those artifacts. Um, and those are very specific in time and place. Those were manufactured in the Savannah River Valley of Georgia and South Carolina approximately 5,200 to 4,700 years ago. The materials are, um, make sure I get this right, these are both soapstone. That is some kind of gabbro-like material, and that is greenstone. This may have come from the Appalachian Summit region of North Carolina. And yet they ended up way down in Florida, approximately 5,200 to 4,700 years ago. So this is a quick little overview of the Tomoka Complex. This is based on an older map that uh, I had generated. Strickland Creek is a 1950s creation. It was dredged along the old dune ridge that the site sits on uh, as a way to, so I'm told by some locals, they were planning to develop this as for residential housing and they wanted to have a nice deep channel for the boats and the docks and the slips. Uh, and then the state got a hold of it and turned it into a park. Mm -hmm. um, but it was purportedly for mosquito control, mm -hmm. although they didn't really have to get that far in to control the mosquitoes. There were plenty of ditches in the marsh as well. But that's, that's neither here nor there. But this is an artificial creek. This would not have been here approximately um, 4,000 to 5,000 years ago. So the Tomoka Archaeology Project um, is a long-term, multi-year, multi-stage research project where uh, I'm going to investigate the origins and the social and environmental context for some of the earliest mortuary mounds in North America. There are mounds in the Mississippi River Valley that are upwards of 7,000 years old, but none of them have burials. The ones in Florida that spring up in the St. John's River Valley in northeast coast of Florida about 5,600 years ago have burials in them. This makes them some of the oldest burial mounds in North America, uh, right here in Florida. So the first stage of Tomoka um, archaeology project, I had some very simple questions. How many mounds are there? Because we didn't know. Uh, estimates went anywhere from 7 to 11. Uh, best guesses. Uh, and then, how old are they? Now there have been some previous work done uh, in the 1990s by an archaeologist named Bruce Piatek, and he excavated in Mound 6, and he got some radiocarbon dates uh, from the base of the mound, putting it about 4,800 to 4,400 years ago. Um, that was the first 
radiocarbon date for an archaic burial mound in the state. So that's one mound out of anywhere from 7 to 11. Um, that makes a suggestive argument, but it's far from uh, resolving the age of the mound complex and its history. So the first stage of work, very simple. How many mounds? How old are they? How did I do that? Mapping and limited archaeological testing and mounded features. Now the reason why we're not sure how many mounds were out there is because this is an old dune ridge. It's undulating. There's lots of little bumps out on the landscape and some of them could be mounds. Some of them are clearly mounds and some, who knows. So with that in mind, I set out to test the ones that were visible and known and then targeted other suspicious spots for testing to determine which were and were not mounds. So uh, based on that work, there were 10 mounds. Not 11, um, but pretty close. And I learned from my excavations in those mounds that the site was inhabited as early as 4963 Cal BP. When I say Cal BP, those are calibrated radiocarbon dates. When you get a radiocarbon date, it calculates how many years the radiocarbon has been essentially decomposing, breaking down its half-life. Um, that has nothing to do with human experience and existence. So when we calibrate radiocarbon dates, essentially what we're doing is we're correlating those with known dates from tree rings. And tree ring dates have a one to two year accuracy. So when we calibrate radiocarbon dates, we're putting it from the half-life of an atomic particle into actual real calendar years for humans. So around 5,000 years ago, up to about 42, uh, 60 uh, years ago, but just to kind of ballpark at 5,000 to 4,450. That's kind of what I was looking at based on my first uh, round of research. Now things have changed, and I'm baffled and perplexed and intrigued by my new findings, but we're going to get to this. So uh, I put the mortuary mound construction at the site between 4963 and 4447 Cal BP. Um, but because I have those banner stones, and those are fairly well tied down, uh, in terms of their age range, we're looking at about 4850 to 4700 Cal BP for the construction of the burial mounds. Um, and before I move on from that, um, I should say that there are four Thornhill Lake Phase <laughs> mortuary mounds. There are three um, St. John's period mounds, and there are f uh, four, three, and then there are three shell mounds that were not used for burials um, that I can tell. Who knows, maybe if I dug in them more, I might find burials, but to be honest, that's not part of my research agenda. I don't need to dig in mounds to find burials. Um, so moving on to other things. Uh, here's a uh, LIDAR map. LIDAR stands for light distance and ranging. Essentially lasers are shot at the ground from an airplane tied into satellites to give it a position in the world. And the, the time it takes to reflect those laser beams back to um, the point of origin can give you a sense of elevation. And based on that XYZ data, uh, a friend of mine created this map for me. And it's relatively representative, but it's not as accurate as I'd like it to be. But this gives you a sense of the topography. Here's the high point of the ridge, here's the slope, and we're on another sort of lower, or, um, but yet elevated area right on the edge of an old marsh. Mound one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Ten was this weird one that I, I found. Um, but notice this little blob here. Um, this was another interesting find that nobody noticed until we had this map. That is a what's called a shell ring. Those are very common in the late archaic from South Carolina down through Georgia and into northeast Florida. It's a different kind of architecture. And here it is at the north end of Tomoka Complex. This is new uh, and baffling. I'm going to come to that later. That's going to be important. All right, um, but just to, just to recap, um, this is a burial mound. This is a burial mound. This is a burial mound. That's a burial mound. That's a burial mound. And that's a burial mound. This is late. This is St. John's 1. Uh, this is St. John's 1. And this one has an intrusive St. John's 1 burial in it, meaning this is Mound 6. This is the one that's 4,800 to 4,400 years old, but people came back later and put a burial in it. Um, because, well, I mean, it's, it's a mound, it's there, why not use it? So, um, just to show off some artifacts, they are entirely unimpressive. Um, this is probably the smallest spear point I have ever found in my life, and it's about 4,800 years old. It was used over and over again. It's almost as thick as it is wide. 
uh, and notice this weird little sort of curvy fracture right there. Uh, that's from an impact. It was used as a spear, it hit something hard, and when it impacted, it sheared off a part of that tool, and it was then subsequently reworked to maintain its usefulness. Um, some bone pins, we had some cool things found out there. Uh, this is a carved bone pin with nested eyes, curvilinear designs, and very, very fine cross hatching on it. And that's about 4,800 years old. Uh, and so are these. Drilled shark tooth uh, tool, the serrations ground completely off the edge from being used as a cutting instrument. And then pottery. I have very little pottery at this site. And what pottery I do have is within the first, oh, 30, 40 centimeters, about the first foot. Um, and it's associated with the late deposits and then it disappears. Very little pottery at the site. Now, moving on to uh, lithic tools. Here's a group photo. There's a tiny little nubbin. There's a distal biface fragment flake tool. The expanded base microlith. This is a drill. Uh, they're commonly found in the St. John's River Valley uh, at sites, sometimes in the hundreds. Uh, and it's very common to this time period that I'm studying. And then there's a tiny little hammer stone, uh, which you would use to sharpen uh, stone tools with percussion or, or hitting the edge of the tools directly. All right, now, what are the interesting things that I found when I was working out here are freshwater snails. Why are freshwater snails in a shell mound near the ocean? These snails have absolutely no tolerance for salt water. In the St. John's River, the banded mystery snail and the apple snail do not live much north of Palatka because of the tidal influence. There's salt water going up into the river and they can't survive in that. That's why prehistorically you don't find shell mounds very far north of Palatka. That's kind of the dividing line. Um, so when I started finding lots and lots of freshwater snails, that raised some red flags for me. Why are there freshwater snails here? Um, and the obvious answer is there were freshwater environments nearby. But these snails need very special environments. They need slow, still, marshy water that doesn't move very fast with lots of detritus. They're bottom feeders. They need leaves and other things to feed on. Uh, so swift moving water, salt water, they don't do well with. So that led me to a hypothesis that prior to some point in time, the Tomoka River uh, and basin were entirely fresh water. So fresh that you could support colonies of freshwater mollusks. And these are just the two major ones. We also have freshwater mussels and several other smaller species, the Seminole ram's horn, the Mesa ram's horn, Elemia, um, and I think one other that I can't remember right now. So we had this diversity of freshwater species turning up, uh, as well as turtles and fishes uh, as well. So there's something clearly going on. But these snails uh, tell us an interesting story. So I put one of my students to work, uh, one of my undergraduates, Stephen. Um, he's now doing this for his master's thesis, but on a bigger scale. So we looked at mounds one and four because mound uh, one is the late end of our sequence of dates, and mound four had the earliest. So with those two combined, we go from 5,000 to 4,800 and 4,800 to 4,400 Cal BP. So we've got the entire sweep there. And basically, Stephen uh, counted the snails from mounds four and one from these two non-mortuary contexts. These are almost all shell deposits. There's very little sand intermixed. Um, and so he quantified the number of the, the mystery snails by level. And they start out abundant, they start out abundant, and right around 4,700 years ago, they're gone, disappear from those two excavation units. So we hypothesize that somewhere around 4,700 years ago, something changed. Possibly sea level rise, maybe a storm that breached the barrier islands and flooded the Tomoka Basin with salt water, killing off those snails. Uh, and it's worth noting that today there are no freshwater mollusks in the Tomoka Basin. You have to go way up into the headwaters of the Tomoka River, where it's basically pine flatwoods draining uh, very loosely into a channel. That's how far inland you have to go before you can actually start finding these snails again. So something happened. Um, that's not important. We'll move on. Uh, so what we think happened uh, here is that uh, we have either freshwater or marine mollusks. There's no brackish. There's no oysters. There's no hard clams. There's no um, marsh clams. Uh, I think Tagalus is the species. Um, so we've got this mixture of freshwater marine. So they're going and getting the Donax clams, the coquina, from the beach. 
and they're going up into the Saint or into the Tomoka, and they're getting the, the freshwater um, snails and fishes and turtles, and bringing them back here to Tomoka. Um, so the brackish species are absent, and when they are present, they're waterworn and tumbled. So they've been moved up and down the coast by tides, tumbled in the surf, collected while they're collecting the, the little donax clams, and accidentally included with us because they're this big and they're water tumbled. Those are not food remains. Those are just accidental. All right, so after 4,700 Cal BP, there are no uh, freshwater, mo freshwater mollusks, and it's about the same time that mound construction ends at the site. It may have gone on a little later, but uh, you know we're working with only a few dates. So I have lots of hypotheses, ideas to explain what's going on here. Um, and so I think, or I thought, there was a change in the local ecology. And so as part of this, this what happened here with the environment and the mollusks, that led to the second stage of the Tomoka project. So this was this is fairly well settled, although I was completely wrong about it, and I'm going to have to rewrite it and apologize to somebody at some point. Um, but that's just kind of how things go with science. You think you know what's going on, and then you get new data, and you have to rethink what you thought. Um, luckily, um, we have some good evidence that uh, sea level rise could be involved. Unfortunately, we have more evidence to suggest that it's not. So I have some other things to consider. All right, so uh, for the second stage of the Tomoka project, um, it's focused specifically on environmental reconstruction. So what was the context like for the natural world when the site was initially inhabited um, and mound construction uh, began? Uh, and here's, here's the happy family right here, the mystery snail, the apple snail, and the freshwater mussel. Uh, and this test unit, test unit 10 from uh, the most recent round of work, has provided some of the most intriguing and frustrating data that I have gotten out of the site to date. I'll, but I'll go on about that in a minute. So uh, for the second stage of work, uh, we tested areas that are not mounds. We already tested the mounds. We know it's there. Um, so as the first part of this research, we did what's called a sediment characterization survey across the entire site core from about here all the way down to here. And that meant every 10 meters, so every 30 feet, we put in the sediment core, removed it, described the contents, described the stratigraphy. We ranked the shell density from 1 to 10, and based on that, we created a density map. And um, it's an ugly map. I didn't want to show it to you, but essentially what we have are four areas of dense shell deposition related to mound 1, mound 2, mound 6, and um, this one down here, Mount 8. In between those areas are lighter densities. So we tested uh, with excavation units in, in between those areas because we wanted to get a nice sample of different contexts. We wanted dense shell. We wanted non-mounted shell. We wanted organically enriched sediments without shell. Um, and so in order to collect the kinds of environmental data um, that we need, we needed to know where it was organic, it was enriched, because that's where things are preserved. When you've got dark organic soils, you've probably had a lot of decomposition and burning. Burning is good. Burning carbonizes plant remains, which means that they're chemically stable and you can recover them. And we'll get to that in a minute. So uh, one of the other things that we did is I tested this little weird landform up here. Uh, it's a raised, um, I don't know, a knoll in amidst a uh, swamp uh, with some shovel test pits, and I'll give you a sneak preview of what I think. It's another mound. We found another mound. Um, sneak, sneak preview, we actually found another, another mound right there. So we're up to 12 mounds now. Um, I don't know what to make of this one at all. This one's pretty straightforward, um, but we'll come to that in a minute. So uh, collecting the environmental data included a couple of different things. One uh, is what's called a column sample. And I mentioned my, my student, Stephen. That's Stephen. He's uh, collecting his column sample, which he analyzed for his, uh, his master's research down at Florida Atlantic. Uh, and this column sample is 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters. They're 10 centimeters in thickness, about four inches. Um, and we excavate 10 centimeter levels within each stratigraphic unit. Um, and there, I think there were three in this one. Um, and then we wash them through window screen essentially. There's our water screening um, operation. Um, bags freshly washed, bags getting ready to be washed, 
our labeling, our drying, uh, and then all of these lovely bags of shell and dirt were transported down to Florida Atlantic University where they were analyzed by Stephen and his mentor, uh, who's a zooarchaeologist. So the zooarchaeology part of this is looking for a couple of things. One, what seasons of the year was a site inhabited? You can tell that from animal remains. Uh, as an example, if you find juvenile deer, that's probably spring to early summer. If you're finding acorns, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, that's not some bizarre archaeology. If you're finding things like acorns and hickory nuts, that's probably late summer, early fall, or fall, winter rather. Um, so we can get a sense of the time of year that different things were happening and the site was occupied. Uh, but also, specifically for this, looking for freshwater species, brackish species, and marine species. Um, I'll leave that there for a second, I'll come back to it. Now, the paleoethnobotany, or the, the archaeobotany, um, we tried a couple different approaches with this. The first one failed miserably, uh, where we would take sediment samples from stratigraphic units and analyze those. And that really wasn't producing much in the way of uh, any kind of plant remains. A few bits of charcoal. Now, when we got to the bottom of test unit 10, we found what's called a combustion feature. There was a fire, uh, probably a hearth. Let's just call it a hearth. Um, and in this hearth, I don't know if you can see those tiny little little dark stains there, those are plant remains. And as it turns out, uh, some of those plant remains included squash. We have squash rind and squash seeds. Uh, and we have acorn, we have hickory. Uh, we also have some grape seed uh, as well. And I think there might be a persimmon from this one. So persimmons, hmm, what time of year are persimmons ripening? So late summer, yeah. yeah. Um, also, acorn uh, seed or shell in here, uh, and you know, that acorn is not usually recovered very often, but uh, we did get some. Um, so the paleoethnobotanist also uh, examined sediments from our um, sediment cores and was pulling out plant remains from those too, including. Do you know what devil's walking stick is? Toothache tree. You know, if you fold up the leaves and chew on them, it'll like numb your mouth. We found seeds from those in one of our sediment cores, um, which is odd because our, our paleoethnobotanist says that those plants like dry environments, and we found them in a marsh. So somebody had to transport them from their point of origin back to the site. So we have some very interesting things going on with the paleoethnobotany um, that I'm still waiting to be amazed by. Um, one of my greatest challenges of working with a multidisciplinary team is getting people to submit things on time. It's, uh, it's challenging. Um, but she's, uh, she's kind of a big deal. Um, she's a MacArthur Genius Award recipient um, and world renowned for her paleoethnobotany. I am super lucky to have her working with me on my project. All right, now I mentioned the sediment cores. Um, the sediment cores are our direct environmental data. So if there was a change from a fresh to a brackish to a marine environment, the sediments are going to tell you. Fresh water is going to be sandy, whereas brackish is going to be a lot siltier, a lot finer particles. Um, also within those sediment cores, you will have plant remains, but also um, you know, mollusks that have different tolerances for fresh and salt water. So um, my colleague, Sean, went out in kayaks across the marsh and into the basin and up the river. Um, and he said that this was not a good day to be out there doing that kind of work, <laughs> especially when you have 10, 12 foot sediment cores strapped to the side of your, your kayak. Uh, but bless his heart, he was able to do it. Um, this is one of the terrestrial sediment cores. This is in one of the marshes at the north end of the site, um, which produced probably one of the best cores that we have a complete um, segment of sediments from the ground surface down through cultural deposits and into the pre-occupation deposits. And we're very hopeful uh, that we're going to get some good environmental data from those, but he is still analyzing his sediment cores. Okay, so uh, what the sediments tell us is what the environment was like at that time. Was it fresh water? Was it brackish? Was it marine? Um, it's not marine until very late. Um, brackish. Mm, we'll have to see, um, but we think we found the area where it was uh, fresh water before the transition, and we're able to get radiocarbon dates from those sediment zones uh, as well, so fingers crossed they don't come out really weird 
because I've already had some very weird radiocarbon dates, um, which I'll tell you about. Uh, so, oh yes, this is it. Uh, this is the one from the North End, Core 2. Um, this is all modern peat, modern peat, modern peat. This is associated with turn of the century dredging. This is pre-turn of the century, and here we have more peat deposits. We're actually going to be able to identify plant remains from this peat deposits and have them radiocarbon dated. So we should be able to tell uh, what kinds of plants we're growing, freshwater brackish, um, and how old they are. Um, so I don't have any answers for that yet because people are slow. Labs are even slower. Now, uh, we did find some interesting artifacts. Um, well, not really that interesting. Uh, here's some rocks. Here's the tip end of a, of a spear point. Here's the stem end of a spear point. And here's some weird rock that was used as a tool. I don't know what to call it. That happens from time to time. Uh, another hammer stone, very small. What's interesting about this one is that on the ridges, the high points of this um, hammer stone, when I put it under a microscope, approximately 20 to 30x magnification, you can see polish from the human holding it in their hand and using it to make tools. They actually wore down ridges on the hammer stone itself through, through the use of that tool. And you want to talk about getting really close to what somebody's ancient occupation was. Uh, or at least how they how they use that particular tool. Down here, uh, two expanded base biker lists. This is a um, a medial and distal st um, segment. Essentially, that's the tip. That's where the drilling happened. And then this is the top, uh, which would have had an extension down this way uh, that broke off. And then this coquina stone hone, uh, probably used for making and sharpening bone tools. Um, you can only see one side at a time, but take my word for it, on the other side there are two more grooves. One of them was so thin that it actually led to this fracture along that edge. They wore through the stone so deeply that at some point it just it broke. So here we have a tool for maintaining and making bone tools, making stone tools, and then I'm not sure what these were used for. We'll, we'll figure that out eventually. Um, speaking of bone tools, uh, here are our bone pins. Notice the, uh, how shiny that one looks. Highly polished. Highly polished bone pin. Um, here we have some medial and distal segments. These are the, the bottom ends. Most of these things I'm calling bone pins over here on this side uh, are polished. They have a sheen to them. Uh, these other things, not so much. Um, this is a splinter awl that broke. Essentially, it's a little piece of bone that you sharpen at one end and you use it to make holes in things. Uh, and then there's this. I call this a bone point. I think this was used in textile production. And here's why I tell you that. This end was hafted into a socket, a handle. And this end has um, linear striations running up parallel with the tip. Somebody was pushing things in uh, or, or weaving with it. And it's also got a high polish, which you can't see in this photo. So it's well polished and it has marks from its use. Um, this is a piece of bone debitage. Notice that, by the way, debitage, Fancy French word for trash. It's like the leftovers. Think of it as wood chips from chopping down a tree. It's just debris. Um, notice, but notice this line here. That is a well-executed uh, circumferential incision around the, um, the top end of a deer leg bone that you would then break it so that you can then make bone pins and other, other bone tools by splitting into quarters. This, however, went terribly wrong. It's supposed to break there. It didn't break there. Um, and my favorite tool, the worked porpoise tooth. That's a dolphin. Or Technically, it's a cetacean, which includes whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Um, probably a dolphin. But what's happened here is there were three different, I guess you'd call them chips, taking, taken off of this thing that gave it a sort of wedge-like pointed top. And on that wedge-like pointed top there is a U-swear. It has been worn down and smoothed out from being used on who knows what wood, shell, bone. Uh, I'm not sure. But somebody made a tool out of a porpoise tooth. I, that is the first I've ever seen of that. And I've asked some people, and they're like, I haven't seen anything like that. So it could be a first of firsts. Um, shell tools, kind of boring. Um, this is what's called a columella awl. It's got that little pointy bit there for making holes and things. This is a broken shell tool of some kind. Uh, really can't tell. 
similar uh, to this one, also broken. A little bit of wear at the edges on the bottom here. So probably used for some kind of chopping, pounding, or things like that. But this one makes sense. This is a Queen Conk Adds. You know, a woodworking tool is beveled on one side for removing wood. Uh, the Queen Conk lives no farther north, I think, than Br um, Broward County. It's a Caribbean and South Florida species. So this came up through human trade networks into this area. Uh, you find them in the St. John's River Valley too. Uh, up here, this is a pretty interesting uh, little, sh little shell object. It is a net mesh gauge. When somebody's making a fishing net by hand, how do you guarantee the standard size of the net? Net mesh gauge. Um, it's been rounded and beveled on both sides, uh, fairly well worn. And then last but not least, a shell bead. Uh, this is the only kind of uh, shell bead that I found at the site. I'm sorry, this is the only example of a columella shell bead I found at the site. And a columella essentially is this part of the shell, where you can grind it, round it out, cut into segments, and drill it from both ends. And so they made um, some shell tools. And uh, sort of getting close to the unexpected parts uh, of my talk, the things that are throwing me for a loop. Um, not this, um, but uh, next slide. Prehistoric pottery. We had 25 sherds of pottery for, I think, eight test units, and most of them came from two shovel tests up at the north end of the site. Um, the pottery is unremarkable. St. John's check stamp, St. John's incised, sand tempered plain, sand and grog tempered plain. People came there for a little bit, they visited, they left. Um, of the later prehistoric folks after approximately 3,600 years ago. Now, here's the unexpected bits, historic artifacts. Um, now, I knew that there was some historic activity on the peninsula. There was a plantation up at the north end of the Tomoka Peninsula. It's called Mount Oswald, um, British plantation, also plantation in the Second Spanish period and the territorial period in the 1820s. Um, but in this stage of research, we actually found historic artifacts in good context, uh, like these nails with um, rose heads or hand, handmade heads on them. Um, this weird lump of lead that was just randomly in a test unit with, I think, this piece of glass. Um, and then another small piece of glass, and then a larger piece of glass, most of which are non-diagnostic. Uh, so we're not exactly sure how old they are, but they're definitely the last quarter of the 18th century and first quarter of the 19th century. Mm. Ballpark. Um, but this is the first time that we found them, and they're concentrated at the south end of the site, which um, coincidentally lines up with historic maps showing areas of rice cultivation directly across from it in the marshes from an 1803 map. Um, so there's probably a, a high likelihood that these objects were associated with those activities in that 50-year period. All right, now, weird stuff. This is what's been just weighing heavily on my mind. I have radiocarbon dates that I wasn't expecting, and I'm, I'm struggling with how to interpret them. Um, I know I'll, perhaps it's a, a character flaw of science to be overly certain, it's better to be honest. I'm not sure what to make of it, but I have a hypothesis, and I can test that hypothesis. So, uh, in terms of the dates and the ages of activities happening at the site, some unusual things happen. Uh, the first one comes from the north side of the shell ring. Um, because of the one sort of late date that I had from the first round of work, I decided to put another test unit in the north side of the, of the, of the shell ring because our sediment survey said that there's sort of mixed density deposits there. There's like not a lot of shell, but there's not exactly a little bit of shell. So we put in a test unit and it produced some unusual stratigraphy, um, but also some radiocarbon dates that are somewhat late. Um, apparently the first deposits were you know, laid down about 4,800 to 4,500 4, to 4,800 years ago, which is right at the tail end of the mound building period at the site. But then everything else happened after that up to about 4281 to 4412 Cal BP. So that's problematic for this reason. Those dates, about 4500 to 4200, um, are consistent with what's called the Orange Period. That's when the first pottery was manufactured in Florida. 
Um, we have found no orange period pottery at the site at all. And normally these sites are just kind of loaded with it. And we have none. So um, that's problematic. Now the next thing that I noticed is we have some weird stratigraphy going here. Notice how light that sand is compared to what's above it and then what sort of cuts down behind it. Somebody in the past between 4281 and, uh, and uh, 4805 dug a big pit, dug it out, and filled it with sand. Now I was a little concerned because in the St. John's River Valley, earlier in prehistory, about, about 5,000 years ago, 5,700 years ago, they were digging pits into <coughs> shell mounds, putting sand in them, and burying people. So I was, I was very disconcerted by finding a pit in the middle of a shell mound of clean sand. Um, and I know it's clean sand because I had the students who were excavating it separate this with lots of shell from this with no shell. So we screened them separately. Those deposits had no artifacts, nothing, completely sterile. Um, and I'm not sure what to say about that pit. I mean, if it was filled with burned things and food remains and artifacts, or even a burial, that's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Um, but here I have a pit filled with the typical sand for the area with nothing in it. And there's only one way to interpret that, and it's the only way archaeologists interpret things and understand. It must be ritual. I can't say that it isn't, but I can't prove that it is. So I guess it's up to somebody to prove me wrong at this point. So we have this pit dug into here for some reason, um, but this confirms the relative recent age of the shell ring. So another shell ring is late. And then we um, jump over to test unit 10, which is fascinating in and of itself, um, which is just to the northwest of burial mound number five. And I thought for sure these were gonna be old, and they're not. 4577 to 4439 for it being laid down, and then 4227 to 4530 for it being finished. That's anywhere from 12 to about 47 years. That's how quickly over three feet of shell deposits accumulated. Now, what's interesting about this is somewhere in here, there's a 20 centimeter zone where we had weird things. We had um, zooarchaeological remains, bones of sea turtle, porpoise, very large sharks or rays. Um, now's where it gets weird. Wolves, pumas, and bobcats. Isn't that unusual? Everything else above and below, fish. And then in these two excavation levels, you have big sea turtles, big sharks, big skates, or rays. Um, Porpoise, bear, I'm not bear, wolf, um, so it's a Florida panther, and bobcat. That's very unusual. What happened? Okay, so another thing that archaeologists don't like to talk about is the R word. I'm sorry, the F word. <laughs> feasting. If you talk to a zooarchaeologist and mention the word feasting, they're like, oh, God, I'm sorry. you guys are going on again about your feasting. How do you know it's a feast? It's like... Big things, weird things, dangerous things. I mean, I don't know how good a wolf tastes, but you know, somebody clearly disarticulated a wolf in this area and left its mandible there. Um, also, it could be the ritual thing, ceremonial regalia, who knows. But this is a very weird area, and it's late. It's obviously not associated with the building of Mound 5, because Mound 5 is 4,800 years old. This is you know, a few centuries later. So I think this is uh, sort of beginning to make the case that there are two, or well, three major periods of ritual and uh, monument building activity out here. So I'm, I'm kind of working up to where I'm going uh, with, with this. Now, other interesting things that occurred, um, I found two shell vessels. Essentially, these are um, conch shells that have the middle of themselves cut out uh, to make essentially these hollow little cups. Uh, and they're often used in later prehistory in the contact period, and even today by Native Americans of the Muskogee Creek Nation in ritual contexts for taking the black drink. Have you ever heard of the black drink, the Casina Holly Tea? Um, so when I found two of these, I got very excited. 
I thought, could it be that I have found the origins in Florida of the use of black drink in prehistory? Um, and so I sent this one, and notice this weird dark stain here. That's residue from whatever the contents were. I sent this off to a laboratory to have it, have it analyzed. Um, and then we found another one right down there, vessel two, right on the edge of that combustion feature, that, that hearth, that pit. Um, so vessel one right about there, vessel two right about there. Um, there's vessel two. It has a broken rectangular fragment taken out of it on the bottom. Uh, and notice the dark staining there from soot. It was used over fire and the fire breaks down the shell. And uh, two of my friends did some um, experiments with this. And basically you fill one of these water, you've got about 40 minutes of cooking time before the thing breaks. That's it. So these you know, are, are, have very short use lives. If you take the liquid out of them to parch leaves or roast something, you got about 30 minutes at most before it, it fails. So um, these aren't everyday things for cooking your meals in. And so um, I sent them off to the lab and had extremely disappointing results. Um, I'll make it easy for you. Uh, it's not what I thought it was. Notice the shell cups here for Native Americans drinking black drink. Yeah, none of that happened. Um, essentially, there were several different compounds that were in these leaves that are unique and distinct and readily identifiable. And then they took the, the, the residues from my two vessels and compared them to those sample leaves that I sent them. And um, one of the critical compounds would be caffeine. The, the Yaupon Holly is loaded with caffeine. You can brew it and make a tea. It's relatively good. Um, I, I recommend it. People sell it retail, but you know what? You can go pick your own leaves for free. All you have to do is parch them. Uh, in any case, caffeine absent from both of my, my vessels. So automatically, that's a deal breaker. It's like, oh, not it. Not black drink. Uh, and then we went through a series of other compounds. Also, not in there either. Um, there is one, however, that was in the... The, the holly leaves and the two vessels uh, residues. Uh, it was a um, a benzene 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 ring molecule um, that they call it an aromatic benzene ring. So essentially, it was a plant that smelled nice, which could be any number of things. It could be red bay, it could be wax myrtle, who knows? But it's, it has an aromatic uh, quality to it. Uh, so it's not black drink. That's kind of sad. Um, I, would, I, would, I would make my, make my reputation on finding the earliest use of black drink in North America. Be famous. Um, not rich, but famous. Archaeology famous, which is very low level kind of famous. Um, but there's still good news. There's another method that I can use uh, called phytolith analysis, where plants have these little silica bodies. Well, those are diagnostic. So if they were parching or brewing any kind of plants, uh, well, they were, as mostly plants, no animals. Um, they can identify those very specific silica parts from those plants and tell me what, they're, what they were. And I should have those results probably sometime in July, which doesn't help me much. Um, all right, now, other unexpected things. Historic artifacts. Um, but we didn't talk about those. What was interesting is when I dated the top stratum 2, there's, there's stratum 2, I got a date of A.D. 1520 to 1653. That is not late archaic. That is contact period. That's early Spanish. Um, so what I ended up having essentially is uh, probably peoples associated with the village of Nocoroco, which is up at the north end of um, the Tomoka Peninsula, visited by the Spanish, by Mejia in 1603. Um, and also the location of the, the Oswald Plantation. And so I have here the first evidence of a late prehistoric occupation at the site, which is also intermixed with historic artifacts. So we have the you know, 16th and 17th century Native American, and then the, um, the, the British and probably American uh, materials as well. Okay, is that it? Nope. Moving on to the future. So uh, the second stage of, of the Tomoka project, oh, let me back up. First stage, how many mounds, how old? Second stage, what is the environment like? Um, those, those results are forthcoming, but it seems to be now that they're almost identical to current conditions in terms of the plants and the animals. The only weird thing 
are those snails. So uh, in test unit 10, uh, which had the weird assortment of different animals, the, the bobcats and panthers and wolves, um, there were freshwater snails in there. So we know that there were still freshwater environment viable in the area as late as 4,200 years ago. So there goes my theory that mound building stopped with the snails. Completely exploded that theory. Um, but recent work done um, elsewhere in Florida by some geoscientists have found that you don't necessarily have to have lower sea level stands for fresh water to be the dominant environment in a coastal area. Um, as it turns out, between four and 6,000 years ago, you had sufficient rain on a regular basis that the outflow from freshwater rivers and streams could keep the area fresh. So, it's not at all what I thought. But the next stage of research, now that I have a better understanding of what the natural environment was like, is to begin looking at the social environment. Uh, or so what is the, the, the world like in terms of other people? So what are the social conditions related to mound building? Um, one of the ways I want to explore that is by looking for variation in how people use space um, by block excavation. So I'm opening up big areas because that's where you find patterns, post holes, hearths, trash pits, um, activity areas where people made bone tools or stone tools or prepared food. Uh, so I need to look in those areas. Um, seasonality studies, which I, I think I mentioned those a little bit earlier, uh, using different indicators of plant and animal species, when things ripen, when they die, when they mature, to figure out when the site was used. Uh, a spatial analysis of the things that I find in those block excavations, and then artifact source identification. People trade. All those stone tools that I have from Tomoka come from someplace else. And one of, one of my areas of expertise is to be able to look at the fossils in Flint, in Florida Chert, and tell you where it came from. And we can get that down to what we call quarry clusters, or areas of similar geologic exposure that are known and documented spatially. And so we can actually trace the movement of artifacts made of stone across the land. Shell from South Florida coming into uh, Tomoka. Banner stones and stone pendants coming down from uh, Georgia and South Carolina into, into Florida. So we're able to look at those things and be able to, in part, reconstruct uh, where people came from and how they were interacting. Um, and one really interesting bit of social information uh, that I have, or gathered recently, is um, cooking technology. Um, so how do you cook billions and billions of tiny little clams without pottery? You, you all know a coquina clam, right? You, you've seen the little, little, little donax clams? Yeah, how do you cook those? Got to boil them somewhere, or sun, under the sun. You're on the right track with boiling, but they don't have pottery. So where do you boil them in? All about the coquina, what's the name? Oh, coquina are little. The yeah, but the shell, if, yeah, but, well, the shells, but if you've got, like, coquina rock. Oh, coquina stone. Okay, yeah. I was going with coquina clam, coquina stone. Okay, okay. yeah, uh, we were talking different, same word, different things. Um, probably what happened: wooden bowls, wooden vessels, and they're dropping hot rocks in them. We have the fragmented, shattered hot rocks, uh, which apparently come from Edgewater uh, or thereabouts. Um, and so I have large cobbles that are relatively un unburned, unused, and then I have literal you know, 30, 40 pounds of gravel from these things being heated and submerged, heated and submerged, and eventually they crack. Um, and most of what we have were called, um, I get constriction fractures, where you put it in the water and it shrinks up real quick, and, and, and basically they're blocky, they're checkered. Um, whereas if they're being broken when they're heating up, they have sort of sinuous, kind of curving fractures. And so by analyzing thousands of pieces of this rock, one of my students was able to find the pattern. Um, not me, I'm not doing that. So it's below my pay grade. <laughs> I've already done that kind of work. So, um, but, but I taught them how to do it, and they, they basically showed that, um, yeah, they're, they're shrinking the rocks through putting them in fire and into water. Um, but that technique comes from the St. John's River Valley. Nowhere else on the Atlantic coast is that ever been identified except Tomoka? And I know because I have surveyed the archaeological literature going back to the 1940s 
there's not fire cracked rock in other late archaic sites along the coast. From Jacksonville all the way down to um, Martin County, they're not doing it. So it looks like there might be foreigners coming from the St. John's River Valley using their fancy rock boiling technology <laughs> to process um, these little clams. So, so there's some indicators that you know this, this site, there's more than one group of people there. In fact, there's probably two or more, at least two. Um, for the mound building, for the, for the burial mounds, um, I think something similar happened later, 42 to 4,400 years ago, where we have that other little spike in activity in the area. That shell ring, that's an architectural feature that is well documented from that time period from South Carolina all the way down to Georgia and Northeast Florida. Well documented. Everywhere they have those, except for one, has fiber tempered pottery. They took Spanish moss, put it in the clay, and made the pots. <coughs> and I'm sure there's some of it around here somewhere. Um, you always find that at shell rings, except for two in Florida. Um, one up near Jacksonville, whose name escapes me right now, and this one at Tomoka. So the Tomoka shell ring is late. There should be fiber tempered pottery there. There's fiber tempered pottery in sites in the St. John's River Valley, even before this. There's, there's some sites with fiber tempered pottery on the coast before and concurrent with the shell ring building. So why aren't they making pottery? They're choosing not to. So what I think is happening at Tomoka, at the very late end of this, um, this period, 44 to 4200 Cal BP, people whose ancestors built those mounds are still residing in the area. They're still boiling their food with little rocks. And then you have a movement of peoples or ideas from Georgia and South Carolina down the coast of Florida. And for whatever reason, these people opted not to make pottery, but they started building a shell ring like their, their northern neighbors. So what we may see is the process of two people coming together and interacting with one another. Uh, it's called um, ethnogenesis, the, the, um, the beginnings of people creating a new identity. Um, and it may be that these folks here at, um, at Tomoka are the last of the Thornhill Lake phase hunter-gatherers who held out until eventually they gave in. Um, but what's interesting is that when they did, when things did change, people left. There's no occupation there uh, with fiber tempered pottery. It's not like they held out for a while and then said, okay, let's make the pottery. They left, they abandoned the site. Um, there, are, there are orange period sites near there, but none at Tomoka itself. Uh, and also no orange period burials that we're aware of. Um, but that's a whole other thing. Um, and that's it, that's, uh, that's my talk. Thank you. How much did the ocean level change in the 4,000 years? Uh, in the last 4,000 years, very little. Uh, there have been some risings, risings and fallings, but it's been essentially pretty consistent. Um, oh, one weird thing I forgot to tell you about, which kind of speaks to that very point, is um, in a pit feature from test unit 13, uh, which is associated with, with pottery, so we know it's late, it intrudes into the older deposits. It's filled with oysters and mercenaria, the hard clams, the, co the, um, uh, the cohogs. And we selected a cohog from that pit feature to radiocarbon date. We sent it off. The date came back very wrong. Very, very wrong. It's approximately 10,000 years old. In a pit feature that should be no more than approximately 3,600 years old. How do we explain that weirdness? I will tell you, freak luck. Um, I contacted the radiocarbon lab. I said, Alex, what gives? And he said, this is not the first time I've seen this happen. Um, he said he had tested for the University of Georgia some of their um, mollusk collections that were collected in the 1930s, radiocarbon dated them. And he had one that came back approximately 9,000 years old. Um, and basically what happens is prehistoric peoples go and collect these clams. Now, you don't always get good viable clams. So somebody pulled one out, 
probably both valves still intact, along with living edible ones, um, and then put it on the fire to steam it, nothing happened. You don't want to eat the ones that don't open. So it got thrown into a pit. And then I come along, 10,000 years later, um, well, probably 2,000 years later, select that one shell that is 10,000 years old out of the wall and send it off for a carbon date. That, 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 that is the, I don't know, uh, I paid $400 for that story. <laughs> um, but apparently this, this is a thing that has happened before. People have just randomly selected a very old shell, but that there are hard clam uh, beds that were established 10,000 years ago, being exploited by people 3,000 years ago, says that it's been pretty stable over that period of time. Now, that doesn't mean that it came from near Tomoka. People have canoes. You can, you, people are pretty mobile. You can move around and, uh, and, and transport those. But somewhere in the coastal strand, there was a, a clam bed in existence for approximately 8,000 years. So that suggests some stability uh, long term. But we know from about 6,000 to 4,000 years ago, things changed a little bit. But there was also a lot of rain approximately five to 4,000 years ago. And that rain fed that river system to Mocha and kept the salt water at bay, probably. Yes? So I mean, I'm probably really missing something here. Do you think these were trade centers where the people would come and trade their tools for the oysters and they'd sit around and eat the oysters and just throw the bones over their shoulder? And um, I don't think it was specifically as like a trade fair. Um, but I do know uh, that people worldwide, when they get together, they trade and they eat. Right. So those are, those are things that were happening. And in, and in the context of at least early on when they're building mounds, there's probably more than one group of people there coming together for ritual events and things like that. And so pe Why did they build the mounds? That's a great question. Um, so, you, okay, in terms of how people dispose of the dead, that's very culturally specific. Um, and it can change through time. If you go back to the early archaic in Florida, before 7,000 years, they're burying people in ponds, like the Wendover Pond down in Brevard County, and the one they just found off of Sarasota under the Gulf. Sea level had risen such that it covered it up and then somebody found it. So there's, there's a bunch of these pond cemeteries. Why do people change from ponds to mounds? I don't know. Um, one thing that we do know is that those pond burials are in South Florida, basically Brevard County South. And in the St. John's River Valley, about 7,000 years ago, they started burying people in shell mounds. And then approximately 5,600 years ago, there's a change where they start putting sand mounds on top of shell mounds and burying people in the sand mounds. Now, uh, that may be indigenous to Florida, we may have invented that, but they were building earthen mounds in the Mississippi River Valley as early as 7,000 years ago. And the people in the Mississippi River Valley were building mounds while people Tomoka were building mounds. And were the shells inside the mounds all the time? The shells were at the bottom. So they built a shell mound, and then on top of the shell mound, they piled up sand. So was it with their trash sites? Well, that's actually a, a, a ongoing debate. Some people see piled up shell as just trash, but others interpret it as being the residues of ritual feasts. And, but to be fair, they're, okay, this is probably this is way out of our, our geography. Um, but in the Torres Straits between New Guinea and Australia, there are islands. And on those islands, um, the aboriginal peoples hunt dugong, manatees essentially and they eat them in ritual contexts, and they deliberately pile up the bones and make these mounded features. Um, why? Well, they still do it. And an anthropologist asked them, and she's like, well, this is, this is just the way we do things. Tradition. Tradition can guide a lot of behavior, um, but there is an underlying cultural logic for it. They're marking and signifying important events by displaying, whoops, the residues of those events. Yes? Do they have any idea at all, the people that lived there, who they were, or? At, at Tomoka? Uh-huh. Oh, that, okay, well, that's a, that's a real good question. Um, we are too far removed from that past to know what they call themselves. Uh-huh. Yeah, we, the best we can get are the Spanish accounts of what Indians called themselves. 
uh, which is often what their neighbors call them, and that's not always very nice. <laughs> so we do know that in this area, it was the, uh, the saltwater Tamukwa uh, who, were, who were residents in this area. But what they called themselves 4,000 years ago, I don't know. And were there other people uh, that were them in other parts of Florida, or is it just that particular? Well, that's, see, that's a good question. Um, so for the, the time period that I work with, the Thornhill Lake phase, um, it, there's a little bit in northeast Florida, and then it's from Lake George down to Lake Harney in the St. John's River Valley. So um, I think the manifestation of the Thornhill Lake phase on the coast are people migrating from the St. John's to the coast. Um, and one thing I didn't mention was that Mound um, B, or sorry, Mound A at Thornhill Lake, uh, where I did my dissertation, is approximately 48 to 4,700 years old. Mound 6 at Tomoka is 48 to 4,400 years old, and they have identical exotic artifacts. Same shapes, same, same materials, probably same point of origin. So there's definitely a connection between those two sites, uh, for sure. Oh, and by the way, um, Tomoka is almost due north from Thornhill Lake. Ah, ah, connection? Mm, maybe. It's certainly nice to think about. Um, but uh, there, there are enough similarities between the two sites that I think there is a real cultural and probably a connection between those two populations. I just have to figure out a way to prove it. I have, I have a hypothesis. Now I need data. Yes. So did, it, did you see any artifacts of them sleeping on the mounds, or did it just look like they were trade centers, kind of? Uh, I did. Well, I mean, finding evidence of people sleeping is, is yeah, tough. I guess. Um, but I, I think what you mean is like living structures. there, living on top of them. Yeah. No evidence of structures. Okay. No post holes. Nothing like that. I wonder where they. Maybe they slept somewhere else and they came. I'm guessing that their dwellings were off of the mounds. Yeah. You would not want to live on an actively uh, deposited <laughs> shell mound. Yeah. But that is very, tools, very unpleasant. But your tools were there. I mean, your. Well, that's where their tools were discarded eventually. Yeah. I think the, a lot of times the shell mounds are the end point of, for things. Have you found any hard metals like <clears throat> copper? You know, they found copper over Crystal River. Area sure. And I have not. Not yet. like that here? Mm -hmm. No gold? <laughs> no turquoise. No gold, no turquoise. Long endings. I do know a guy who found a gold bead in the in the keys though. On a for a prehistoric site. It can happen. Rarely, but it happens. Any questions? Fantastic. Well, join me in thanking uh, Dr. Jones.